those who say that the E92 is the last of the real M3s. Today we're going to find out if that's true, but also I'm going to tell you about the good things on this car, because it is pretty special, but also some of the bad, some of the problems that they have, and we're going to have a quick look at the pricing, how much you can get them for now, and then decide how it stacks up against its competitors. If you have a car, one of your cars that you want me to do a review on, please get in touch at this address. Now there's one thing which we have to start with because I think it's what utterly dominates this generation of M3 and that is the engine. It's a naturally aspirated V8 with a red line at 8,200 RPM. So a bit of a mental thing. It's basically the V10 minus two cylinders, which has some real pluses and a couple of real minuses as well, as we will discover. So first of all, let's just fully experience the V8 with a nice pull up the road. Everybody has always agreed about one thing, that this engine is mega. And on the evidence of what we just heard, I would be in agreement. But this car cheats a little bit because it has some different bat boxes. One of the things that people did say at the time was that, although the engine was mega, the sound was slightly strangled by BMW, more than it should have. And that is not the case with this one. The V8 was BMW's response to Lexus and Audi. They had to move on from their inline six in order to compete. When it came out, the declared horsepower was 420. I think that nowadays most people agree that what you will get out of one of these is probably closer to 380 or 390. There was another problem. Although it sounds spine tinglingly gorgeous uh, and when it goes towards the top end, it is just, it almost makes me emotional. One of the downsides of having such a revy engine is that they weren't very talky. I think one of the other issues is that you could quite easily just do a little bit of work on a standard 335 and make it quicker than the M version. And I think some of the buyers were a little bit disgruntled by that at the time, but this is more about the experience, not the outright power. If it doesn't have 420, to me, this one certainly doesn't feel far off. It's plenty quick enough. Wow, this is, this is brilliant. Now this one has EDC, so the adaptive damping, and let's just see how it handles on the twisties. I'm now in M mode, so that gives me, I think the suspension is in normal mode, so not comfort, but not too stiff. And in terms of traction control, it allows a little bit of slip. What an utterly mental thing. I drove one of these some years ago, and this is this is so much better than, than I remember. You're essentially keeping it between five and a half and eight to be making good progress. That's where it sounds its best. That's where it's most alive. And then it is a very quick car. Steering is precise and sharp. It's precise and sharp, and I would say that it's one of BMW's better systems, which doesn't make it brilliant, but in my mind, it's a little bit better than the E46 helm, which I always found very, very dead. The chassis, though, and the control is really good. 
And there are those who prefer the standard suspension and those who prefer the adaptive, but I can't make a comparison here. To me, this setup feels great. It's not overly stiff. There's enough control there. I think when you're at the limit, you can feel the weight a little bit though. And that's one of the negatives about this car. We'll talk about that more in a moment. So far though, absolutely brilliant car as a Hoon. Absolutely brilliant. The engine sounds amazing. It's revvy, fantastic. The chassis control, very good to me. The damping feels good. Maybe a little bit, a little bit too stiff even in normal mode, I think. Um, but if you're really on it, it's fine. The sports mode, way too stiff for normal roads. This car has another major plus for me, and that is the gearbox, which is a good and a bad thing, I suppose, because this isn't really an exceptional part of the experience if you compare it to other gearboxes. It's a BMW box that has that same kind of notchy feeling that most of them have. It's light, reasonably crisp. Now, this one has a shorter lever, which makes it a bit snappier. Um, but it's not exceptional in feel. However, the DCT, I just wouldn't get on with. And that's not because there is a fault with the DCT, with the auto gearbox, it's because there's a fault with me. I do not get on with flabby paddle auto gearboxes, no matter how good they are. And the DCT is one of those boxes that you either drive fairly sedately, and it can be quite smooth, but if you drive it hard, it's quite a violent bit of kit. So to sum up, for me, the fact that this is a manual is a real positive experience. You have the last naturally aspirated three series, and along with that, it kind of makes sense to have the manual box, although perhaps for many people, that wouldn't be the best choice. As a machine to drive hard then, I think that this is just fantastic. It has approachable performance, a really addictive engine with a howl at the top end which can't help but make you smile. Steering which is doesn't get in the way of the whole experience. It's not exceptional but it, it's good enough and better than some other BMW systems for sure. some issues with these. The first is the weight. So 100 kilos roughly more it weighs. The previous generation M3 weighed about 1550, 1540 kilograms. These are 1640, 1650. 100 kilos is a lot of mass and it's hard to hide. And I think when you get closer to the limit, it removes a little bit of the crispness which you do get on the E46. These are also thirstier than the previous generation. You could be expecting, I think, an average of very low 20s if you're driving it more or less normally, or plummet if you're driving it like I have been today. Previous generation cars, more like mid 20s, sort of even high 20s, I think, if you were being gentle with the inline six. More importantly, though, and maybe more concerning, is that it also inherited some of the mechanical frailty from the V10, so the rod end bearings can also go on these. Now, to be fair, if the car has been treated properly, always warmed up before it's been driven hard, then they tend to last pretty well. But if you have someone who thrashes the car without letting it come up to temperature, then they can wear prematurely, spin, and then you're in a lot of trouble. I think between 1,500 to 2,000 pounds to get them replaced for peace of mind, so not ruinous, um, but it is something to bear in mind. Also, throttle actuators, which also have affected other BMWs. The gears were plastic. There's two on these. They do go, um, but the solution isn't too ridiculous nowadays. About 600 pounds will replace both for items that are guaranteed for life. That has been done on this car as well as the rod end bearings. Thank you so much to Darren for bringing it down, by the way. 
at relatively short notice. It's lovely how easy it is to play with the throttle and you have the extra sort of nanny BMW traction control keeping it in check if you're not that talented. So almost anyone, I think, just get it on the cusp of the power around 5,000, put your foot down and the back just pirouettes a tiny little bit. Very satisfying and it really flatters the driver. I think one more thing Darren told me that people are becoming aware of at the moment, owners rather, are becoming aware of is that the injectors can fail, they can become jammed open. But those are the main three things to sort of keep an eye out if you're going to buy one. For the performance on offer, the brakes also do not inspire confidence. At the front, they had single piston calipers and they're just not very reassuring, even on the road they can be prone to fail, but apparently it is quite easy to at least make them okay for the road by having braided lines on there and some pads with a little bit more of an aggressive compound. Don't go for a complete track setup, which will be noisy, dusty, and so on. But if you just get more of a sports pad, it can really make a difference. Now, do I really think that we can call this justifiably the last of the real M3s? And I guess it depends what generation you're from. You know, some people may say that that was the E46, for example, um, because that was the inline six. I don't think, in fairness, that this loses out in many ways to the E46 in real terms. They're not quite as incredibly pretty, but I mean, an E46 M3 is, to me, the most perfect looking M3 of all time. So in those terms, okay. The engine on this, as nice as the inline six is, it's on another level. Okay, it's not very torquey lower down, but it's part of the engine's character that you have to thrash it. To get the most out of it, you have to be revving it because that is where it sounds so glorious. So yeah, maybe it's not super torquey, but you have to rev it anyway. So does it really matter all that much? I don't think so. Also, maybe not as pretty as the E46, but all the same, this is a handsome car. Had it been following any other design, I think people would have made more of a fuss about the way that these look, and they have some really nice detailing as well. Now, price-wise, if you're thinking of getting one, I was still under the impression that these were an absolute bargain. But in fact, when I've looked, Prices seem to vary between sort of 15 for a starter car with maybe a few minor issues to 25 for a really perfect later spec one. Um, competitors for these are C63s and the RS4. The C63 is much more of a muscle car. It's got a lot more low down power, but I think less finesse overall. So if you're after longer term satisfaction, I think this would ultimately deliver better than the C63, which is more about uh, cheaper, quicker laughs. The RS4 is also in the same price range. So you're still looking 15 to 25, but it seems to be a bit more expensive than these. They're, they cost a bit more, there's more car towards the, the top end of the price range. If I had to pick right now between all three of those, it would be the BMW. Um, it's just that this engine is just incredible. It just dominates the car. Everything else is great too, but the engine's an incredible experience. I recently also did a comparison between an E46 M3 and its Alpha GTA competitor. Do you have a look at that? Because that will give you a little bit more insight on the E46, but also on how a car which is very flawed but in ways better than the BMW compares, that being the Alpha. Thank you all so much for watching. Thank you to Darren for bringing it down and see you for the next video.